Welcome to Building with Brick, Foundational Wisdom on Coaching, Careers, and Christ. This leadership podcast was spawned by Coach Brickner's book, So You Want to Be a Coach, which is the story of a corporate executive who made a drastic career change and became a head men's basketball coach. Dr. Brickner's book is available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook on Amazon.com or go to his website, www.drjoebrickner.com. That's D R J O E Brickner.com. Now, here's this week's podcast. Welcome, folks, to another session of Building with Brick. It's a podcast that's uh, based on the foundation of careers, coaching, and Christ. Uh, It was spawned from a book that I wrote uh, about a year ago called So You Want to Be a Coach, and it's a story of a drastic career change that I made personally. And um, in the process of writing that book, I thought, you know, people need to know more than just what I think. And so I decided to start this podcast and invite successful people, leaders, uh, who can share their information, share their story, and be of benefit to you in creating your own story. Today, I'm just thrilled to have Mike Tharp. Mike is a name you may not recognize unless you're in the journalism field. Uh, Mike was a teammate of mine when we were in college. He was a senior when I was a freshman. We played it together on the national championship team back in 1967. Mike um, was was a mentor back then and remained so after that, too. I mean, it was just terrific to have someone of of his intelligence. He's, you know, after he got out of college, he... um, Got a scholarship to go over to England and study, and he was just a a great mentor for us young folks. And I'm just pleased as I can be to have Mike with us today. Mike, welcome. Thanks a lot, Joe. Good to see you again. Yeah, it's always great to see you. Um, People may not know your name, but you are an international journalist. Had some great leadership positions, especially in Japan. Uh, covered various wars, uh, just have had a terrific career. Uh, you've not only been a journalist, you've been teaching some college classes. I think you coached a high school team for a while. <laughs> and so you've worn a number of different hats, but mostly it's been the journalism side. And uh, I, I want to talk to you today, first of all, about how sports played a, a role in your success your career success. And the first question I would have for you then is is growing up, you know, what sports did you play? Were you simply a basketball player or did did you play them all? I mean, you're probably great at all. Uh, I played three of them. Well, I played four if you count track and field. Uh, This is all uh, freshman year in high school and younger than that. Uh, Basketball, baseball, football, and track. But when I, and I played football freshman year in high school. And then, uh, after that, I decided to focus on basketball instead. But in the last three weeks of my junior year, the football team was having a really bad season. So the head coach asked me to come out and uh, learn to run some plays as quarterback. <laughs> and uh, here I was looking like Ichabod and Crane. I got the last remnants of any uniforms still around. 6'3", 155. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, the head coach had me uh, introduce me to the team. He said, you guys all know Mike from that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's he doing here? And coach bent over the ball. He said, he's going to take some uh, handoffs from center, and we'll see if we can work him into playing a little 
quarterback for us. And so he got down and I put my hands underneath him and he said, no, no, harder. I got to feel you. I got to feel you. So I slammed my hand right up into his crotch and he just fell over the ball. He was, he was not wearing a cup. <laughs> And the rest of the team went crazy. Uh, as as it turned out, though, Joe, uh, I didn't play quarterback, but in the very last game of the season, I started at defensive end against mm-hmm. Immaculata in Leavenworth, Kansas. Yeah. And these were all the sons of the prison guards and the corrections officers. So they were really bad asses. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the first play, they came around my side for 25. And the second play, they came around my side for 20. And then that was the extent of my football experience <laughs> in high school. <laughs> but all the, all the while, I was uh, playing basketball because that was my first love. Mike, what the, where did your competitive drive come from? It was internally generated i didn't have an older i had two older brothers but they were around they were living in other places by then and so it wasn't like larry bird having one or two of his older brothers kick his ass day after day until he got better mine was internally generated i just uh was a perfectionist and Mm -hmm tried to uh, be better at certain things and, and playing ball all the time. And an incident happened in eighth grade in the winter, in December, so you know how cold those days are. And uh, this 60-year-old guy asked me if I wanted to go find the game, and I said, sure. So he drove us up to Highland Park uh, High School outdoor court and uh, there were these two other guys there. One of them was about my height but had 40 or 50 pounds on me and uh, we were playing two on two and I got the ball and started to drive the lane and he gave me a forearm shiver right in the heart. <laughs> I went down, I, I was seeing spots, and I could barely get my breath back to say, foul. <laughs> and uh, then I got up and I had Roger, my teammate, take the ball out so I would get the ball coming back in. And then I did the same move. I took it right down the lane, had him, and scored over him. And from that day on, Joe, I was... Never afraid of anybody on a basketball court. That that's terrific. Um, well, you grew up in Topeka. You went to Hayden High School. Tell us a little bit about your your team, and then how you eventually came to St. Benedict's and became a teammate of mine. Eventually, well, we uh, had a wonderful team our senior year. We had good teams every year, but Senior year, we entered a new league, the, the Centennial League, with teams from around northeast Kansas, including Atchison. And we we played league ga- games uh, where, wherever we could because our gym was too small. It only held about 400 people. Our, so we just used it to practice in, and then we'd go to – uh, Washburn University to use their gym or uh, the municipal building downtown to use that gym for our home game. So we were kind of uh, a team without a home. But that also brought us closer together. Uh, Greg Bean, whom you know, and mm-hmm. uh, Ed Tucker, Don Gregg, and Lonnie Williams and I would go downtown from uh, Hayden West for the first year that school was in operation. 
and go downtown to the old gym for practice. Take we take turns driving, Greg and I, and uh, just being together, the five of us in those drives brought us closer together. Bean is a, a incredibly cerebral player and concentrated on defense, uh, which was extraordinary. Hmm. Tucker was our big man. He later played at Long Beach State, where I think he still holds a couple of rebounding records. And Don and Lonnie were uh, great, uh, were a guard and a uh, forward, respectively. And we had a, a pretty good bench too. And we just. Uh, uh, decided, uh, not in any kind of team meeting or anything, but we decided we'd try to take it as far as we could. We had a fantastic coach named Ken Butel, mm -hmm. who was the best motivator for players that I ever played with or for. And, uh, he, he was also one of the funniest coaches ever. And people still talk about some of his tales. Like once he said we we couldn't beat the Little Sisters of the Poor, and one of the sports writers at the Capital Journal found a, a nunnery of the Little Sisters <laughs> of the Poor and <laughs> asked them if they had a ball club, <laughs> or would they be interested in playing Hayden? And he got a pretty funny story out of it. But our big rival was Topeka High, and they had talent out the wazoo. Uh, and, uh, they had, I think, three guys on the front line, 6'4 and above. And uh, uh, we played them at their place. Uh, we, we we won one, lost one, and this, this was the match game. To, see who went to the state tournament. And Coach Butel devised this plan to take him by surprise, and it did. He had Tucker, our center, bring the ball up against their press, so he brought the big guys away from the basket, and we were able to operate underneath there pretty, pretty freely. And uh, it was a close game down to the wire, uh, but we eventually won by one or two points. And so we go to Wichita for the state tournament, and our opponent in the first round is Salina, which had a Gulf State basketball player and football player named Jeff Elias, who later played football at KU with Gail Sayers, and uh, we were going up and down, back and forth, and I didn't uh, think, I mean, I thought he was pretty good, but mostly he was just big, mm -hmm. and I was quicker to rebound than he was, and I got one board, and I came down and Stepped on Jeff Elias's foot and turned my ankle, and I wasn't very effective the rest of the game, and and we lost. Uh, and afterwards, I know you could identify with this. The three seniors, Tucker, Bean, and I, stood in the showers until everybody had left, and. We kept standing there because we knew as soon as we turned off the showers, our high school careers would be over. Eventually, we got dressed and walked back to the hotel. Actually, Greg Bean carried me on his back because of my sprained ankle. Uh, but that shows you how tight we were as teammates. And friends too for the rest. we've lost two of those guys now uh to cancer and mm -hmm. 
but we did a lot of things together long after graduation in 1963. As far as how I <laughs> went to St. Benedict, it was almost like a divine intervention. Uh, somebody coming down and pointing his finger at me. <laughs> Our assistant principal was Father Thomas Santa, oh, yeah. who later became a brother at St. Benedict. Hmm. But then he was a diocesan priest and uh, really kind of a hard ass in every way you could expect. Uh, he wasn't, he was fair, but he was a hard ass. And he called me to his office one time. And, uh, you haven't applied to any colleges. And I said, well, Father, I thought that uh, maybe I'd take a year off and work and see what that was like. And he said, well, that's real interesting, but sign here. I <laughs> have this application for you at St. Benedict's College. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I signed and he submitted it. And I luckily got uh, an all-expense academic ride. Uh, to SBC. So that's how I wound up going there. Only one I applied to and the only one that accepted me. But if it had been for Tom Santa, who knows what would have happened. He just reached down and intervened. Well, how did you how did you end up being on the basketball team? I mean, obviously they would have wanted you to play. Had had they talked to you about coming there before then, or did you just no, kind of show no, up? No, I was your literal walk-on. Wow. I, I played ball every afternoon after classes with the two scholarship guys in our class, Jack Dugan and Don Sherry. And I, I saw them doing things that I'd never seen before from high school players, and uh, I kept up, and we we played a lot of three-on-three uh, three and five-on-five five games when we could have the gym, and uh, then the tryouts began. Bill Samuels, the assistant coach there, ran the tryouts, and he taped a schedule on – one of the walls there by the uh, iron circular staircase uh, that leads down to the dressing room. And it was uh, various uh, distances to run and times and so on. And we mistakenly thought that we had to do it all that day. And, uh, <laughs> So it, it was pretty insane, pretty intense. And we, uh, at, at, by the end, there were only three of us. Dugan and Sharing had dropped out sometime before. And, uh, there was me, there was a guy named Ed Pratt who later played football at, with, for the Raging Cajuns. And uh, a guy named Bill Agnew who wound up playing golf at the University of Houston. But the three of us are the only ones who did it all. And when Sam found out about that, he was really impressed. But he didn't want to say much because uh, it was kind of dumb of us to <laughs> not figure out that it was a daily schedule or a weekly schedule on a daily. So anyway, uh, I made the team. Uh, I think. Sam was instrumental in having me do that, and so I I started, of course, practicing with everybody and playing on the freshman team and sophomore year. I started started on the JV team, and once in a while, Coach Nolan, our head coach, would let me suit up for a varsity game, and I was really. Uh, really stoked about that whenever it happened. I didn't get into many games, but what, once we were playing Washburn, I think this may, yeah, this was sophomore year, and uh, <laughs> somehow 
I I got the ball and went down the lane and banked in a layup. And for gosh sake, I turned around and started skipping down the court because <laughs> it was my first college basket. <laughs> and the Bean told me later that the head coach said, you, you let that kid score his first ever basket. You can't allow that shit. <laughs> so, <laughs> I didn't do much skipping after that. Oh, that is, that's funny. That is funny. Now, uh, you mentioned Jack Dugan and, and Don Shearing. Um, they were on our national championship team. They were our captains. And interestingly, right. Dugan is the reason that I went to Benedict's. His father, I know it, it's clear in your book that his dad was instrumental in bringing you there. Yeah, wouldn't have been for his dad, I'd, I'd have probably gone to uh, one of the smaller schools in, in Ohio. Baldwin Wallace wanted me to yeah. play for them pretty badly, but uh, and, and they played a good schedule. They played Notre Dame and some other D1 schools, but huh. there was just something about. You know, the opportunity to go out and play where Jack was playing, and I had heard they had an All-American there who was Daryl Jones, and I thought, well, shoot, yeah. it sounds pretty good to me. So I ended up going out to Benedict's instead, which was the best decision I ever made. Uh, listen, well, Mike, I think the, I... the description in your book that you wrote of uh, how the bus pulled up, in, is it Armour, Missouri? <laughs> Across the, the river. Yeah, the train. <laughs> yeah, the train drive. You guys out. got <laughs> literally into hay trucks. Right. <laughs> rode the last four miles to campus. I, I don't know what I would have been thinking. Well, as I said in the book, I I thought uh, I thought they'd have log cabins for dorms, you know, and I thought <laughs> well, they didn't. it was I was expecting the worst and. Uh, as you know, it's a beautiful campus, gorgeous place, and I fell in love with it as soon as I stepped on campus, but as well, you probably did too. But I think we'll take a short break, Mike, and, and uh, when, okay. we come, when we come back, what I'd like to talk about uh, to begin with is what coaches influenced you most, uh, especially that kind of drove you to be a successful journalist, you know. Was there something that happened along the way that some coach just instilled in you? Maybe it was Ken Butel that instilled in you that, that sense of excellence. So when we come back, uh, let us talk about that a little bit. Sounds good, Joe. All right. 